one of the surprise blessings of digital worship is that Tom has been able to compose more and Ariel has been singing the songs. Beautiful. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Goldilocks and she went for a walk in the forest. After a while, she came upon a house. She knocked on the door. No one answered. And then she walked right in. Okay, hold it. Who does that? This, I can't believe we tell this story to our children. It's like a training manual for sociopaths. Goldilocks saw in the kitchen a table with three bowls of porridge upon it. She went up to the first bowl, tasted it, and it was too hot. Okay, hold it again. Who does that? Who eats someone else's food? But it goes on. She tastes the second bowl of porridge, and it's too cold. And then she tries the third bowl of porridge and it's perfectly warm, and she ate it all up. I still can't believe we tell this story to our kids. I hope Goldilocks got some help. You know, with modern rehabilitation techniques, you can become a productive and responsible member of society. I actually use the Goldilocks strategy in my approach to the Bible. Not the sociopathic stuff, but I mean, I try to find the right temperature you see, some people are too hot with the Bible. They say, you better believe everything literally or you're not a true Christian, that it's inerrant. Or some people are too cold with Scripture. They barely pay attention to it. Way too cold. They think it's just an old book of silly superstitions. I try to approach it warmly, to love the Bible. Not be too hot, not too cold. Love it, take delight in it. Let it be a guide for our faith. Let it help us understand Jesus Christ more fully so that we can live in his way. I like a warm approach, but so many people take it either too cold or too hot. Actually, even at First Plymouth. No church ever gets it right every moment. Sometimes we're too cold with scripture. Don't pay enough attention to the Bible. Other times, maybe we pay too much attention. We should take delight and let it shape us, form us. Have you ever heard of the all or nothing fallacy? It's a logical fallacy that crops up in people's rhetoric sometimes. Um, so for example, take this sentence. Led Zeppelin is either the best band in the world or it's not. Okay, actually, that's not a, a fallacy. Um, there's only two choices there. Um, by the way, Led Zeppelin is not the best band. The Who is the best band. Any band with Pete Townsend is the best band. But take this sentence. There are only two types of people in this world. People who love Led Zeppelin and people who hate music. Okay, that's a false dilemma. That's the all or nothing fallacy. You can love music and dislike Led Zeppelin. In fact, maybe that's a likely possibility. The all or nothing fallacy. This happens in our approach to scripture as well. That, that you either take it all, that you have to accept everything in the Bible is literally true or you're not a real Christian. That's the all or nothing fallacy but we do it again and again. Actually, you're empowered through the loving vision of Jesus Christ to choose to take some passages literally and some not. Do you know, even the staunchest fundamentalist is actually picking and choosing, which is, that's okay if they're doing it in a holy, loving way, but that's not always the case. They choose some passages to focus upon. So for example, some Christians will focus on a small handful of passages that say being gay is wrong or a sin, but there's lots of other ones they don't focus on. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 21 says that you should stone your child if they're stubborn or um, rebellious. 
Well, no one would follow that. So how are they picking and choosing which passage to follow? I hope they would do it lovingly, but we make mistakes at times. I was talking to a banker, a deeply faithful man, and he was troubled because there were a few passages about how it was wrong to be gay in the Bible and that, that disturbed him. He felt like he had to follow the Bible. But then I asked him, I said, why, why don't you follow the 50 or even 100 passages that say you shouldn't take interest on loans? That's in the Bible. Why would you pick just a couple passages to follow and 100 not? Well, we do pick and choose with scripture. So I pray we do it through the vision of Christ. Picking passages that lift up the human spirit, lift each other up and increase our faith in God. The all or nothing fallacy. That fallacy crops up in our scripture today. We're in Isaiah. We've been using the texts of Isaiah to illumine our advent this year. We're in chapter seven, verse 14, a key verse that people say you have to believe it or you're not a real Christian. It's the verse about the virgin birth, 714. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young virgin, well, that's in the Greek. The Hebrew actually says a young woman, so it's not a clear translation. The young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. There have been some Christians that say, unless you believe literally in the virgin birth, you're not a real Christian. In fact, in 1910, uh, the Stewart brothers that owned Union Oil, they published and sent across all across America the fundamentals, the, the, what true Christians should believe. And the very first one was about the virgin birth. But I think it's fine either way. It's not an all or nothing. If you take the virgin birth literally, wonderful. If you don't take it literally, wonderful. As long as you're moving forward in your faith and seeking to follow Jesus, it's not an all or nothing. Now, you don't have to believe all the miracles in the Bible for sure, but I would say to you today, pick at least one to believe. No, no, you see, if you were to say that miracles weren't possible at all, then we're trying to reduce God to the level of our minds, what we imagine is possible. I think the miracles help us realize God is beyond the grasp of our finite minds. So pick at least one miracle in scripture to take literally. Anyone you want, because that will leave open the awesome power of God for you. You know, there's a miracle in first Mark that is you know, it's nothing too crazy. Peter in -law's, uh, Peter's mother-in-law has a little fever, kind of a headache, and Jesus heals her so she can continue her domestic duties. It's a very small miracle. Maybe take that one, and then you leave open the possibility, oh, the truth, that God is way beyond our imagination. So, actually in Isaiah chapter seven, there's another part of that verse that I would be more worried about if you take literally. The virgin birth either way is fine with me, but I would worry if you take the part about Emmanuel literally. Emmanuel means God with us. Oh, let me explain. You see, in the faith, we use a lot of spatial metaphors. A spatial metaphor, you know, a metaphor is when you take an image from some domain, you transport it into another domain to illumine it, but it doesn't fit. So a spatial metaphor like God is with us or God is above or within, those are spatial metaphors. We bring those, but then we're talking about God and God is not a spatial phenomenon. Keep following me. You see, if you believed literally God is with us, you would be reducing God to an object in the universe. So keep following me. You see, you know that God is not up there or out there because our Christian doctrine teaches us that God is infinite, right? This is like my favorite aspect of God, infinity. So God is not a finite being alongside other beings. So when we use spatial metaphors, use them to brighten your understanding, deepen your understanding, 
but don't take spatial metaphors literally. It is the infinite loving God that isn't within us or beside us or above us. It's an infinite God. You see, somehow in a mystery, we are within God. God is the very creator of reality. Keep following me. Every moment is created out of the infinite love of God. Spatial metaphors should never be taken literally because they reduce God. Keep following me. You see, our metaphors try to take hold of God, but the infinitely loving God holds us. We use metaphors to try to believe in God, but the infinitely loving God believes in us us. You see, this Christmas, I don't want to wish, wish you just a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you an awesome Christmas, that it will dawn upon you again through the beauty of Christ, that our God is infinite love. Oh, take that literally. Amen.